Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all things Starship development news and spaceflight updates. Last week, we had a crazy launch calendar with three Falcon 9s, two of them launching just four hours apart, three long marches, an electron, and a potential actual date for the Starship orbital test flight. Yep, Elon took to Twitter last week to state that SpaceX will be ready to launch Starship in only a few weeks, with launch timing dependent on FAA license approval. He then continued that, assuming license granting takes a few weeks, the first launch attempt should be near the end of the third week of April, which for those of you who don't speak American date format, translates not so subtly to a launch date of 420. Which, while very funny, because of course all the kids know that this is the weed number, on a slightly more serious note, this could also be a good tribute to Ship 20 and Booster 4, which formed the first ever full stack of Starship and at one point in time were destined to fly the first Starship orbital flight, a role that has since been taken over by Booster 7 and Ship 24. Flight 420 may still happen then, just 420 because of the date, not because of the ship and booster names. On the subject of Ship 24, it looks like its heat shield tiles are now all in place. There are a few spots that needed to be filled in following the removal of its crane lifting points, and of course the need for lifting points in the future will be abolished once SpaceX puts its new two-point lifting rig into surface. This will grip the ships the same way the chopsticks do. Ship 24's counterpart, Booster 7, remains stationed next to the pad, after being temporarily removed to allow workers to work on the orbital launch mount unobstructed by the behemoth booster. NASA spaceflight photographer Jack Baer captured lots of components being added to the top of the orbital launch mount, and we've started seeing a second staircase being installed on one of the orbital launch mount legs. The other staircase is encased in shielding, but it's located right here, and I'm sure that this new staircase, when finished, will be cladded in a similar heat shield system. As for Booster 7 itself, there aren't a whole lot of updates to discuss, although we did see SpaceX workers remove the aero covers for both of the booster's hydraulic power units, as seen in this photo from Starbase Surfer. It's unclear if this was just for routine servicing or inspection, or if there was an actual problem that needed to be fixed. If the hydraulic system is proving to require a lot of continual maintenance, then it's a good thing that Booster 9 will be doing away with all of that, instead using electric motors to control the gimbal of its center Raptor engines. This booster continues to have its engines installed in the Mega Bay. This montage from Lab Padre shows a number of Raptor 2s being moved from the Raptor storage tent to the Mega Bay for installation. I'll continue covering the construction of Booster 9 over the coming weeks, as well as everything else Starship and Spaceflight, so make sure you've hit subscribe so that you can stay up to date. And hey, if you're enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to leave a like down below, helps feed the almighty algorithm and all that, and I always do appreciate it. Booster 10 is not that far behind either. Lab Padre streams captured the new booster's aft section being transferred to the Mega Bay on Friday, and we also saw Booster 11's common dome section moved to the Mega Bay as well. Things are probably getting a little bit crowded in there, but probably not as crowded as the high bay. <laughs> Ship 28's forward section was stacked and completed last week, and there are now two other full stacked starships in there as well, as later on in the week Ship 26 was squeezed into the high bay. SpaceX was super busy beyond just Starship last week. We saw three Falcon 9 launches. The first was on the 15th of March, and this was NASA's SpaceX Commercial Resupply Service Mission 27. The Falcon 9 rocket took off from the Kennedy Space Center, carrying the Cargo Dragon spacecraft for the 27th Commercial Resupply Mission to the International Space Station. Over 6,000 pounds, or around 3.7 metric tons, of cargo, including NASA investigations, supplies and equipment, were transported to the crew aboard the space station. The Dragon spacecraft is expected to remain attached to the orbiting outpost for about a month, after which it will return to Earth and splash down off the coast of Florida, carrying research and return cargo. Also along for the launch were a few CubeSats, including two CubeSats for NASA's ALANA program, which stands for Educational Launch of Nanosatellites, in order to attract and encourage students to enroll in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics professions. The first of these CubeSats on this mission was ArcSat-1, developed by students at the University of Arkansas. Its primary mission is to measure atmospheric conditions by detecting a LED signal from orbit. Once the mission is complete, the spacecraft will make use of a solid inflatable balloon to increase its drag and speed of its re-entry. The second CubeSat is called Light Cube, developed by students at Arizona State University. It carries a flash bulb that can be activated by radio amateurs to provide a brief flash visible from the ground. 
These CubeSats and all the Alana Sats that came before them are exciting examples of how student teams can develop innovative technologies to conduct scientific experiments and inspire others to get involved in space exploration. The second and third Falcon 9 launches took place only around four hours apart from each other, both launching on the 17th of March. The first of the two was Starlink Group 2-8, which saw a Falcon 9 launch into the clear blue skies from the Vandenberg launch site. This was the 75th operational Starlink mission for SpaceX, and its success puts the total number of Starlink satellites launched to 4,104, with roughly 3,807 still in orbit. With each successful launch, the Starlink network becomes stronger and more reliable. Shortly after second stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage descended down to the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which was stationed just over 660 kilometers downrange from the launch site, where it successfully made its eighth overall touchdown. Having previously supported the Enrol 87 and 85 launches, the SARA-1, SWAT, and three Starlink missions. Just over four hours later, another Falcon 9 launched into the skies. I love how in the SpaceX stream, you can watch the blue skies over the Kennedy Space Center turn to black as those nine Merlin engines cause the poor old camera to forget what the color blue is. <laughs> this was the SES-18 and 19 mission, which saw the two Luxembourgian SES-18 and SES-19 television satellites placed into a geosynchronous Earth orbit, marking another milestone in the multi-billion dollar program to clear the C-band spectrum for terrestrial broadband. The satellites were both built by Northrop Grumman and will serve a 15-year mission to provide C-band video and television programming for media networks and cable providers across North America. Shortly after second stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage performed its controlled re-entry before touching down on the deck of the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. This particular boost up, 1069, previously supported five missions, CRS-24, UTILSAT Hotbird 13F, OneWeb 15, and two Starlink missions. Rocket Lab were back in action last week. An Electron rocket hit the pad at Launch Complex 2 at the Virginia Wallops launch site for Rocket Lab's Stronger Together mission, their second mission from Launch Complex 2 in Virginia. This was all paid for by Capella Space, a leading satellite manufacturer and Earth observation company, who commissioned the launch as a dedicated mission to deliver two more of their Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR, satellites to orbit which will allow Capella Space to provide high-quality, high-resolution SAR imaging with the fastest delivery time commercially available. This capability will help organizations across the public and private sectors to make informed and accurate decisions. This launch was Capella Space's second launch with Rocket Lab on Electron and their first launch from Rocket Lab Launch Complex 2. China had a busy week last week as well. We saw three different Long March vehicles take to the skies. The first was on Monday, this was a Long March 2C, a two-stage launch vehicle known for its high reliability and success rate of over 96%. Standing at 42.5 meters tall with a diameter of 3.3 meters, it can carry a payload of 3.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This time, it launched an Egyptian remote sensing satellite named the Horus 2, which will be used for Earth observation. The next Chinese launch we saw last week was on Wednesday, the 15th of March. This time, the rocket was a Long March 11, a three stage all solid fueled rocket specifically designed for quick response launches, capable of being launched from mobile launches at sea or on land. It can carry payloads of up to 700 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and this time it carried the Cheyenne 19 satellite to low Earth orbit. The footage we have doesn't really show the liftoff itself too well, probably for a reason, but the launch location was the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in Gansu Province, China. According to official sources, the experimental satellite entered its planned orbit successfully and will primarily be used for land resource surveys, urban planning, disaster prevention and mitigation, and other missions. The final launch from China we saw last week was on Friday the 17th of March, and this time it was a Long March 3BE. The most powerful of the three rockets we saw last week, the 3BE is a launch vehicle designed to carry heavy payloads to orbit, capable of lifting payloads weighing up to 13,500 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Such a capable machine was needed for the single GFN-13-02 satellite payload as it needed to be placed in geosynchronous Earth orbit rather than low Earth orbit, which requires a lot more delta V to reach. According to official sources, the GFN-13-02 is a high orbit optical remote sensing satellite and will be mainly used in land surveys, crop yield estimation, environmental governance, meteorological early warning and forecasting, as well as comprehensive disaster prevention and mitigation. And I gotta say, some credit is definitely owed to the launch team here. These drone shots of the launch are amazing, and I would love to see more drone captures from other launch providers. Look at you, SpaceX. Imagine a drone hovering just near those landing barges.
Lawn Aerospace had another busy week last week. We first off performed a mini-scale Skylon mission, delivering a small probe to the Muna Stargate, and then later on in the week, we decided to launch an attack drone from the back of an SR-71 Blackbird in order to unlaunch another YouTuber's space shuttle. <laughs> if either of those videos sound interesting to you, then maybe one of them is on screen, but if not, you can just click through to my channel and check those out. And I gotta give some massive thanks now to the names scrolling on screen. They're my Patreon members and my YouTube channel members, and it's their support that allows me to keep on making this content. If you wanna join their ranks, there's a Patreon card on screen, or you can just follow the links in the description below. But other than that, guys, I do hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space this week, and goodbye!